Tonight's first storyteller is Anne White. Anne Bastian White is a graduate of Illinois State University and was involved in elementary education for over 27 years. Since retiring, she has been active in a variety of theatrical pursuits in Bloomington Normal. These include community players, Heartland Theater, Evergreen Cemetery Walk, and other historical portrayals. She continues to serve as the program director for Young at Heartland, a senior acting troupe. Anne has made four trips to the Soviet Union and or Russia, and she is one of the founders of the local Vladimir Cat Canterbury Sister City Association. For a number of years, she brought Russian folk tales alive for elementary students using puppets made in Vladimir, Russia. This is the first time she has told a story for Next to Normal. And when asked what she's not afraid of, Anne told us, riding an elephant. <laughs> Sounds like another story. Let's welcome Ann White. Good evening. My story took place in 1988 in the Soviet Union. There were a group of citizens in Bloomington Normal that wanted to start a sister city relationship with a city in the Soviet Union because my late husband, Bill White, had led several Illinois Wesleyan student groups to the Soviet Union, they went to him for advice. It was decided that letters would be sent to the three cities of Oriel, Chernigov, and Vladimir. We received back letters from all cities saying they were very excited about having us choose them as our sister city. Of course, in 1988, the Soviet Union was a police state, and observation and uh, other kinds of monitoring of what you're doing was par for the course. Everyone knew that the American embassy was bugged. Well, so were hotel rooms and restaurant tables. We'd even heard about one couple that said they were staying in a high-end hotel in Moscow quite a nice suite. They had a grand piano. The uh, wife was a pianist and had played several pu musical notes and, and songs on the piano, turned to her husband and said, it needs tuning. <laughs> well, they went out for the day, got down to the lobby, and she remembered something she'd left in the room. Went back upstairs. Someone was busily tuning the piano. <laughs> so, yes, you're your words are monitored there. When you would go into a hotel, it was a single door, single file, past a security guard. And your keys were never kept with you. Every floor had a key lady. So when you would go to the floor, you would get your key from the key lady, and then she would uh, be able to monitor anything that happened. So whenever you left your room, you again left the key with her. Another thing that was rather disquieting was our guides kept our passports. We couldn't keep them with ourselves. So with all of that security and all of those uh, thoughts of what might be like in the Soviet Union, I do want to tell you that the Russian people were very welcoming and anxious to have conversations with Americans. Uh, I'll skip back for just a moment to 1983 when our family and our two young teens were with us. We went to the Soviet Union and we were in the, uh, what's now Moldova, and we were in a hotel there and met a rock band. And they were so excited, you know, Americans, teens, they were really, and they said, oh, please, we are heading out to a concert. Set your clocks for 2 a.m. and come to our room so we can have conversation. So we did it. <laughs> 2 a.m., they even entertained us with some balcony wine, which is a story in itself. <laughs> They were filled with questions about, you know, does everyone wear blue jeans? What are the latest crazes in music? And how on earth did you elect an actor for a president? <laughs> well, some things we had answers for and some we didn't. <laughs> so back to the Soviet Union in 1988. The first city was the city of Oriel. 
and we were greeted warmly by the guide. She took us on a, a brief tour around, pointed out several monuments. One was to the largest tank battle during World War II, and the Soviets had defeated the German troops at that particular time. Another monument was the birthplace of I.S. Turgenev, a Russian writer. When we met with the officials and the mayor, we were treated to a banquet and a meeting, and they made a big pitch for choosing them as our sister city. The next day, a small group of us had made arrangements to take a bus into town, and we were all going to be doing various things. Some just wanted to walk the streets, others saw a couple museums. Bill and I decided to go to the outdoor farmer's market, and I was so intrigued with it. I mean, the way they displayed their vegetables and their fruit, it looked as if they took each individual carrot and cleaned it and then spread it out for a display. So my camera was very busy. <laughs> I love taking pictures. Well, Bill and I had each wandered a different way, and I thought, well, I better catch up with him. At the back of the market, there was a tall stairway up to a large building that I assumed was probably where they held the market if the weather was bad. Bill was at the top of the steps involved in a conversation with a very angry-looking woman. I later nicknamed her Moscow Mama. <laughs> well, when I joined them, the conversation had something to do with my picture-taking. Bill was using his rudimentary Russian, trying to figure out now what, you know, what was the problem. He couldn't get anywhere with her. She marched us into the building where we were met by a uniformed officer. She went on in a loud voice with much arm gesturing about what our crime was, or, or my crime, I guess. The officer took charge of us, took us to a very small room with a desk and a chair and two chairs. He didn't say a word, walked out, closed the door, and there we were. Now, Bill was calm and said, you know, it's gonna be okay, don't worry. I was not calm. I could think about every movie I'd ever seen with a KGB interrogation. I'd seen scenes where people disappeared, you were never heard from again. I was petrified. Well, we were there quite a while, and then the door opened and a different uniformed officer came in. Didn't say anything. Seemed to have a, a manual with him. He sat at the desk and went page by page to the end. Then he went page by page back to the beginning. He stared at us, and then he said, and smiled. Dasvidaniya! <laughs> That's Russian for goodbye. <laughs> well, I have to admit, through clenched teeth, I said, Dasvidaniya, and we hightailed it out of there. Well, of course, by the time we got back to the group, we were quite late, and apparently I was white as a ghost. So everybody froze and said, what happened? What's wrong? I couldn't say anything. I, I guess I was in sort of a state of shock. I, I don't know. I just knew if I said anything, I would just fall apart. Well, Bill said, it's OK. We got on the bus. So on the way back to the hotel, he explained, it really wasn't anything. We were detained a while, and, it, and it's OK. I still couldn't talk, even when we got back to the hotel. By then, everybody in the small group was abuzz telling everybody else in the group about Anne and Bill were detained. <laughs> well, I, like I said, I, I was really in a state of shock because the day before, we'd been with the mayor, and then here I was hauled in like a convict. Well, by dinner time, my nerves were calmed, and I agreed with Bill that, you know, it really wasn't all that big of a deal. The next day, we were to take the train to St. Petersburg, 
And so in the morning, there was a bus at the hotel to take us to the train. And the guide told everyone, as soon as the, the bus gets you to the train station, get off and, and you, what cars we had to enter. But Ann and Bill, you stay here. <laughs> okay, that, that did it again. Blood pressure up and walking down the platform was another uniformed officer with a chest full of medals. He had a brief conversation with the guide and then she started interpreting. He was profusely apologizing for our being detained. He was the commandant of the entire oblast. Oh, oh what a relief, no KGB. I could get on that train and head to, uh, head to St. Petersburg. But I began to think, what on earth was in the pictures? Why had that been such a problem? The only thing I could think of was, did I take a picture of someone whose picture should not be taken? Well, I could hardly wait to see those pictures. <laughs> but remember, this was without cell phones and without digital cameras. So you had to get home. You had to get your film to the, the Photoshop and then pick up your film and get it home, which I did. Spread out the pictures on the dining room table. I could hardly wait. OK, let's look. There were no pictures from the farmer's market. All right. Well, oh, when I was, took the film out of the camera, put it in my, uh, it dropped, I lost it. Or that night when we were at dinner, <laughs> did someone come into our room and confiscate that roll of film? Hmm. Two mysteries I will never know the answers to. But one thing I can definitely tell you, being detained in the Soviet Union gives you sweaty palms. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne.